thing, new relationships. Uh, effective analytics are about relationships. Analytics people have to work with a whole variety of organizations. Uh, one of the things Anne was saying last week when we were uh, both speaking was she had a very close overlap with the IT people at Cisco uh, in terms of, you know, they knew something about analytics, Anne's group knew something about IT, and just formed a very close working partnership. That same morning, uh, Friday a week ago, I had interviewed again some of the people at Marriott who were involved in revenue management. And it's always um, uh, a good test. I was talking to the IT person at Marriott who's involved in revenue management. And it, you know, it's almost predictable as the sun coming up every morning, at least the sun coming up in places other than San Francisco. Um, uh, he said, well, I wanted you to um, also be able to talk to the business side person in revenue management. Every time I ever work with Marriott, they say, okay, if you're talking to the business side person, we want to get the IT person on the call. If you're talking to the IT person, we want to get the business side person on the call. It's like they're joined at the hip. Um, but lots and lots of overlaps in terms of responsibility, skills, and, and so on in these partnerships with IT organizations. Uh, Building relationships with business decision makers is absolutely critical as well. Um, you know, one of the things they say at Procter & Gamble is in, in their analysts, they look for four things. They look for analytical skills, IT skills, business acumen, and relationship skills. Which are the hardest to find and train? Relationship skills. Uh, so, in fact, at, at P&G, they now assign a, an analyst to every one of 29 key decision makers in the company. Uh, again, sort of joined at the hip in this relationship. The analyst's job is to create one breakthrough business result per year for that executive's business unit or brand. Who's the judge? the business decision maker, of course. So that forces them to talk about, you know, what would be a breakthrough business result and where should it be focused and, and so on. Some people apparently do it in a month, some people haven't done it yet. Uh, but you can start to see how that forces the kind of relationship we're talking about. Uh, the other thing I think is uh, increasingly, we have this incredible uh, outside ecosystem. You can see them on the exhibit floor here. There are a lot of smart people in the world, consultants, vendors, uh, uh, providers of uh, skills and tools and so on, and we, we ought to take advantage of that. It's crazy to try to do all of this ourselves. Um, communications are critical and rarely taught. I won't say who this is, but I was um, at, last year, at the Informs Practice Conference, where the, the more practically oriented operations researchers go, and I was sitting next to the department chair for industrial engineering, which is where they produce a lot of operations researchers, at a university that actually churns out more operations research masters and, and PhD students, graduates, than any other school in the world. Uh, she was a very pleasant person. We are having a nice conversation. And I said, oh, by the way, do you, do you have any courses or anything in the curriculum on how to communicate about analytics and OR to you know, some of the people who are going to have to, have to you know, make the decisions around them? And she said, what do you mean? I don't get it. It was a bad sign, I thought that she had no idea what I was talking about. There are a few programs, like this one that SAS sponsors at NC State, uh, that are starting to spend more and more time on how to communicate effectively about analytics. It's a very critical skill. I'll say some more about it in just a second. Uh, so my poster child for this is, is Carl Kemp at Intel. Um, I, I was telling Ann, I should have had a picture of her. She's better looking than Carl Kemp um, anyway, but, um, Carl is an interesting guy. Uh, one of his favorite sayings is, if you want to be good at analytical decision making, it's not about the math. Which is a striking comment for Carl Kempf to make. Carl has a, a set of jobs. Uh, he runs a decision engineering group at Intel. He is an Intel fellow, one of these people who 
can wander around and do whatever he wants. There are about 50 of them at, at Intel. Uh, he's a good pal with Craig Barrett, the, the former CEO, and he has the title of chief mathematician. So if the chief mathematician can say it's not about the math, you've got to believe it. What is it about? He says it's about the relationships. Uh, so the, uh, he says, you know, we, in every project that we do, by the way, he reiterated what I, I said about re-engineering decision making. He said, nobody has ever come to his decision engineering group and said, help us make a better decision, Carl. Uh, sometimes they'll say, help us justify the decision we already want to make. Uh, if he's lucky, they'll say, help us speed up a, a, an existing decision. He says, often we can improve it along the way, but he says, on every project that we work with a business on, we have two goals. Get the business person to have a little interest and respect for the math person, and get the math person to have a big interest and a lot of respect for the business person. Why is it not symmetrical? Well, um, you know, it's the job of the math person to improve that decision. The business person has a lot of things going on, typically, and this is only one thing that he or she is going to be interested in. So anyway, he tries to, to inculcate that uh, respect. He says the math person has to understand the intuition and speak the language of the business person. Carl does the same thing in hiring that Ann Robinson does. Uh, uh, he, uh, he'll be interviewing somebody and say, um, you know, tell me how you would solve this business problem. And if the person can't engage on the level of the business problem as opposed to the math involved or the, the operations research techniques involved, he says, forget it. You're not going to be a fit in this organization. You've got to do both sides. Um, whole new set of skills. This is kind of hard to read, so I'll read it for you. I don't know. I, I'm, actually meant to, I found this on Google Image, I meant to provide a credit for it, but then I couldn't find it again after I initially found it. So this is our new web analytics person, Pawnee Walla. She has an IQ score of 180 and degrees from both MIT and University of, of Mumbai. She can also move inanimate objects by telekinesis and read minds. Uh, so the, the web analytics uh, uh, crew says, hello, hello, she says hi. Silence for a little while. You're reading our minds right now, aren't you? No, I don't have a boyfriend. Uh, so <laughs> telekinesis may not be on the list of necessary skills going forward, but there are some relatively new things. Um, one of the things that people often said to me, Joe Megabo at Expedia said it, and Robinson said it, you got to be able to tell a story with data. Joe hooked up with some of the people in the finance organization who he said, uh, you know, they were the best I could find at being able to tell an effective story with financial data. You know, put the numbers that don't really matter in the appendix and just tell the story. Uh, you know, a lot of people can tell stories. A lot of people can work with data. There aren't that many people at the intersection of those two things. So, you know, figure out what your story is. It uh, probably means some some massaging of the data. Some people would say torturing of the data to get it to tell your story, but uh, without a story, you're not going to influence the decision very much. Stand firm when necessary. Um, I've been working with some very smart people in the commercial analytics group at Merck, and uh, the head of that group, a guy named Patrick Moore, says, you know, people will come in and say, I hear you have some good approaches to promotion analysis in your group, Patrick. He said, yeah, yeah, we do. Would you do that for, for me? I have a promotion I want to analyze. And he says, well, yeah, first let me ask you a question. He says, we'll either find out that your promotion was fantastically successful, marginally successful, or unsuccessful. He says, tell me what you're going to do in each of those three cases. It's a little cheeky to push back like that, um, but if they don't have an answer, if it's clear that there's no decision to be made, Patrick says, hey, we work for the shareholders of Merck. Um, we're not going to waste our time uh, just doing an analysis that nobody's going to use. Chevron says, you know, they hire uh, analysts for their decision analysis group. They say, one of the traits we look for is courage. It kind of sounds like we're hiring Boy Scouts here, trustworthy, loyal, courage, obedient, thrifty, thrifty brave, clean, and reverent, whatever. Um, 
But being able to push back when a decision maker says, you know, I don't trust your data or I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use it. I mean, there are times when you gotta shut up or you're just gonna lose your job. But um, pretty important, I think, to know, can I push back a little bit and influence this decision or not do the analysis at all if it isn't gonna lead to one. Uh, one of the things a number of people said is, we're not just doing the numbers, we're, help, we're helping frame this decision. We're pointing out to the decision maker, by the way, you don't have any stakeholders in this decision other than yourself. By the way, you're not even identifying what are the alternatives to your preferred decision approach. People at HP said, uh, uh, supply chain analysis group do, have been doing this for years, say, you know, now we don't even work if there aren't a clear set of stakeholders. We help frame the decision from the, from the very beginning. And then uh, fixing the problem too. Joe Megabo told me this as well. His group, uh, they see a problem with a the website, they go ahead and fix it. Uh, it saves a huge amount of time and probably a huge amount of money. So uh, these are things that we don't typically think of as things that analysts do, but I think we, and you can take them too far. You know, you know Joe's group I think is responsible for half of all system development at Expedia, which might be going a little bit far, I don't know, but um, uh, it's useful, I think, in many cases to think, how can I broaden out my skills to include this, this portfolio? I also think we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna see some new analytical architectures. Uh, and you know, I know less about this, by the way, with regard to conversion architectures. I know something about it with web analytics. I know a lot about it relative to, to predictive analytics. Uh, historically, what we tried to do is say, okay, um, we have this group of business users, and one of our goals is to get them to do their own analysis. Self-service. You hear it a lot, you don't see it very much. Uh, it's one of the great failures of our profession, I would say, this whole idea of self-service. Why? Uh, well, it's, it's the, um, the upper left quadrant of this matrix up here. It's multi-purpose applications. Here's your big analytical toolkit to draw from. Uh, anything from, you know, chi-square to regression analysis, a factor analysis, whatever, it's all there. And by the way, here's a bunch of data too, big data warehouse, go get what you need. People can't do it, too hard, too complex, can't find the data that they need. Uh, so um, that old sort of business intelligence model, I think, is going to start to migrate into a variety of different models. We're still going to need uh, professional analysts. I'm sure you'll all be happy to hear. Uh, uh, in many cases, what we're going to have for them is, you know, that multi-purpose environment, and great, they can deal with that complexity. Uh, we, we're starting to call that an analytical sandbox, where it's designed for experimentation and uh, iteration over time. Uh, the stuff that is going to be in production, let's put that into our systems and processes. Let's make that embedded analytics, and we still need professional analysts for that, because they're the only ones who can figure out, one, is it a bulletproof algorithm, and two, can we get it into our existing systems and, and processes? Not going to be easy. But for the business users, I think we're going to have to shift to a single purpose environment. Uh, much simpler one, and it's basically, I think it's an app environment. You're starting to see this, SAP, I, I was uh, speaking to an SAP group, I think uh, they can maybe tell you about it if, if you want at their, their booth. Uh, the conclusion is, you know, this other stuff was just too hard to use, data warehouses too difficult to navigate, mobile devices, I mean, can you imagine sorting through all these tools and the architecture of the data warehouse on, a, on an iPhone? or even an iPad, it's just, just too hard to do. We have a lot of decisions out there that need support. Uh, we need to kind of narrow the field and say, okay, if this is what you do in your industry and in your role, here's a little app that's gonna help you. Uh, so this is my um, iPad screen, no, just kidding. Um, uh, uh, going a little bit overboard, but these are some actual analytical apps in, in various industries. Uh, there's one for nursing productivity in healthcare that uh, SAP co-developed with, with um, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Merck has developed a little field sales hiring analysis app 
that says, okay, you're out in the field, you're running a territory, you lose a sales rep, should you hire another one? We thought it'd be very useful if they had a little app for that. It's pretty narrow, but very useful. Truck loading analysis in retail. Uh, 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 another BI company that I work with ha has one of those. Mortgage portfolio analysis and banking, financial planning and modeling in government. These are all you know, relatively narrow areas, single industry, and I think that ultimately we're gonna see these things um, proliferating, you know, maybe not like iPhone or iPad apps, but lots and lots of them eventually. And they'll be co-created by vendors and users and, and systems integrators and, and so on. Uh, so could be a whole new model of how these things operate. Of course, you know, the, the single biggest driver is always the analytical culture. Um, in your organization are facts and evidence and analysis the primary way of deciding, not the only way. Uh, you know, a hypothesis, after all, is nothing more than an intuition about what's going on in your analysis. The thing is, you know, in analytical cultures, we test that hypothesis. Uh, uh, we, wh where we don't know, we try it out on a small scale. We, we test everything that, that moves. Uh, you know you will have succeeded when in meetings people start to say, excuse me, where's your data? Uh, I was talking to eBay about this. You know, eBay doesn't do anything. I was impressed a couple of years ago. They talked about their testing platform. They don't do anything without somebody saying, excuse me, did you test this? Google, you won't get anywhere unless somebody says, well, we have 100 million users. You try it out on any of them? Uh, so that culture, I think, makes it a huge amount easier to do your jobs. You probably can't change the whole culture, but we can all start pushing back in meetings and say, oh, by the way, got any data? Um, you know, at, at Intel, they say uh, anybody can raise a question. In fact, you have the obligation to raise a question if you have doubts at Intel, uh, but it has to be backed up with data. Uh, so very critical thing. And as I said a couple of years ago, the analytical competitors just never quit. This guy at Marriott, I think they're the best still in the industry at revenue management, but constantly looking for new functionality. Uh, I, I was talking about, do you work with outside vendors on that? And he said, yeah, um, we do. In fact, we've concluded that we don't want the rest of the industry to be too far behind us, because if other hotels are making stupid revenue management decisions, that hurts us too. Uh, so we want them to be good, but we want to always be better. So we're constantly thinking about what functionality we can add. Um, okay, so I hope I've persuaded you that, uh, you know, these are fantastic times we're living in. A whole new uh, model, a whole new community for analytics is emerging. It's clearly going to require new management approaches for how all these things fit together. Uh, we can't sit in our corner anymore. We need to fraternize, share um, ideas. One of the things we're going to do in IIA and Millie at SAS is going to write a little um, set of papers for us on how you can borrow techniques from other areas. There's a lot of potentially positive interchange in that regard. No matter what level you are, you can have an impact on all of this. Certainly if you're CEO, you're going to have more of an impact, but it's no reason to stop if you're not. You can uh, l help lead your organization into this new environment. Ultimately, it's all about better decisions, so keep thinking about, you know, am I connected to the decision maker? Do I have the stakeholders clearly identified? Am I using the right methods? And if the right decisions aren't being made, what, what can I do differently? Uh, this is, I think, an historic opportunity uh, for all of us. Uh, it's a fantastic time to be in analytics, and I hope that you will all take advantage of this great opportunity and transform your own organizations. Thanks very much. Mm. Uh.